opinion. Uh, which agencies have been relatively more successful in dealing with this challenge? And I've heard uh, several of the witnesses refer to Treasury Department, but uh, what have the agencies uh, done differently and could their experiences be used to better address this problem in other agencies? And uh, when do you anticipate that this uh, material weakness will be resolved and no longer cited in the U.S. government reports. Uh, the issue of the preparation of the consolidated financial statements ha has really three dimensions to it. One, you need to have good information at the individual agencies, and, and as we've heard this morning, the Department of Defense, Homeland Security, NASA, and State have uh, not been able to get unqualified opinions, some for many years. So that's one issue. You have to have the foundation in the individual agencies. Second is that the individual agencies' financial statements need to be consistent with Treasury's accumulated financial reporting that it has in place. And so far, there have been some difficulties reconciling the audited financial statements of individual departments and agencies with Treasury's records. Let me just say, yeah. are there firewalls between these agencies? I mean, are, are they not sharing? Uh, well, no, what do you find? Yeah, there's, there's uh, you know, sharing of information, but part of the problem is that there are different uh, systems that Tracking. keep the records. Oh. And this is particularly problematic in the agencies resolving differences in these intergovernmental transactions themselves. And there are tens of billions, if not more, transactions that take place. And for a decade or more now, different things have been tried in order to get the agencies to reach agreement among themselves. OMB and Treasury have tried to facilitate those uh, type of reconciliations, uh, and some progress has been made, but not enough in that area. Now, some of the new ideas that OMB and Treasury are beginning in this new innovation office that they're creating to have more central accounting systems with standardized definitions and having uh, data uh, from the vendors offers a lot of promise to use modern technology to solve this issue. And, and unless there are better technical applications of the technology, uh, you know, as Car Congressman Issa mentioned, I mean, th this problem is so pervasive uh, and, uh, and you have so many different systems, it's hard to do that reconciliation. So I'm hopeful that the concepts underpinning some of these new initiatives that OMB and Treasury are just starting. Uh, I know they know the issues very well. Uh, the, the solutions have eluded them uh, to date, but I'm hopeful with new applications of technology that they can be solved. I believe, you know, we've had a decade of experience now trying to solve this with the agencies working among themselves, and that hasn't proven to be uh, fruitful. Well, we know technology is really progressing, keeping up with it, right. and being able to pay for it is one of the stumbling blocks. In testimony before this committee last summer, you expressed concern about the January 9th, 2009 revision of OMB circular uh, number A27. Do you remember that? Financial management systems. And uh, noting that the revised circular uh, sub uh, Sustainability reduces the scope and the rigor of compliance testing for agency and financial management systems. Yeah, my, my understanding is that, that uh, there will be further refinements to that circular coming out okay. shortly, and we were going to take a look at that. And once we make that assessment, we'd be happy to provide our assessment uh, to, the, to the subcommittee. That would be great. Um, how might the closing of the Financial Systems Integration Office further affect agency compliance with FY uh, 2010 financial reporting requirements? Were you aware? Yes, yes. I was aware that uh, that action was going to take place. We closely coordinate with OMB and Treasury through the Joint Financial Management Improvement uh, Program. Uh, I, I believe that the concerns underpinning that and the fact that there have been a lot of uh, expenditures made to improve systems. They haven't always uh, made the necessary improvements. And I, I believe that uh, there ne this needs to be monitored carefully going forward. I think that, the, again, the concepts 
that OMB and Treasury are moving to, I think, are worthy concepts, and, but a lot will rely on the implementation of the programs. And they'll have to be careful attention to make sure that the standards that were in place before are adhered to. But I think the, the, the fundamental premise that technology was moving faster than the agencies could, could, could keep up with uh, it was a correct uh, interpretation of the situation. And I do think that their new efforts can be effective, but a lot will depend on the implementation and the details. Thank you so much, Mr. Strzok. We're now going to proceed on with the minority member, Mr. Strzok. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, thank you to our uh, panelists for your uh, remarks. Um, obviously, uh, you are the messengers. Um, but as our uh, constituents want to hold us accountable back home, uh, we have to look to you uh, to be accountable for um, the oversight. And, uh, you know, there's so much content in this, and I hope this is, uh, as Mr. Issa said, the first of many hearings on this issue because um, one of the numbers that, that is glaring to me um, is this $98 billion figure. Um, I'm reminded of a year ago when uh, the president brought forward, uh, brought together his cabinet and said, uh, we're going to begin by tackling uh, the budget deficit by asking my cabinet members to bring forward $100 million in voluntary savings uh, for next year over this year. Now, I don't know where we are with getting those recommended $100 million in potential savings, but I know one thing, $100 million is a pittance compared to $100 billion. Um, and with all the talk this year with the health care reform bill and cutting out fraud, waste, and abuse, it would seem to me one of the biggest abuses um, in this, uh, uh, these discoveries is the fact that we potentially paid $98 billion of taxpayer money to people who shouldn't have received the money. And I would, I would feel a little better if we were moving in the right direction. Uh, but it's almost a 30 percent increase over the last year's uh, estimate of um, unnecessary payments. So I guess my question is uh, to Mr. Dodero and, and Mr. Warfel, if you feel comfortable piping in, is uh, what are we doing and what do we need to do to ensure that, number one, we're moving in the right direction and, and, and hopefully someday uh, we're not spending nearly $100 billion of taxpayer money uh, to folks who shouldn't receive it. It's clearly, this wouldn't be acceptable uh, in the private sector and, and uh, I think it just perpetuates the notion that many of our taxpayers and constituents back home have that the federal government uh, doesn't do a very good job of managing their tax dollars. Uh, thank you, Congressman Schrock. You're right. This situation is, is not acceptable, and there needs to be action taken to address it. Uh, one of the things I would point out is that one of the success stories coming out of the CFO Act and the uh, emphasis on financial statements has been the identification and quantification of improper payments. Prior to that, there was really no quantification of it. Now, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, what needs to be done is, number one, not all programs that should be reporting improper payments are reporting improper payments yet. Part D in the Medicare program, for example, is not yet quantifying improper payments, and there's a number of other areas. Uh, number two, there needs to be consistent methodologies used over a period of time so that you can have comparable information. Right now, one of the big reasons for the increase has been a, a change in the methodology used under the Medicare uh, program and the improper payments. Thirdly, there needs to be key accountability, targets, uh, and uh, metrics uh, expressed for each of these individual programs because some of them have a long history of data, others have just one data point. Uh, I might uh, point out, and I'm sure Mr. Worf will eliminate or, or uh, elaborate on it, is that uh, the OMB has just put out guidance uh, implementing an executive order to name accountable officials for each of the areas where there are improper payments, to put a dashboard in place and metrics, and to report targets for reducing the improper payments. I'm very encouraged by those steps, and I believe those will provide the foundation for further evaluations of progress. Well, let me follow up to that. I'm aware of the executive order, uh, but uh, from my perspective, this isn't, doesn't seem to be a problem of not having um, 
the appropriate number of, of experts. In other words, I, I don't uh, have reason to suggest that the people who are working on this in past years who have attempted to reduce the number of improper payments were, were not capable of doing so. Um, and I'm asking for your opinion on this. I might suggest that perhaps it's the data uh, and the systems that we're using uh, to be able to hold these different agencies internally themselves accountable for um, you know how they're paying out uh, whether it's their POs or their uh, uh, their accounting systems and so my question would be uh, do you think it would be appropriate for Congress uh, to mandate a universal uh, accounting system uh, and collection of data so that across the systems across these different departments they would all be using a similar mechanism uh, which would not only allow them to be held accountable, but more importantly would allow folks like yourself, Mr. Werfel, and all the respective parties to, to appropriately audit them and better hold them accountable. Yeah, I, it, the systems issues are definitely integral to solu uh, solving the problem. But each of these programs are a little bit different. So they, the, I think Congress should begin uh, examining each of the individual programs and make sure they have the appropriate systems in place. Now, part of the dilemma in solving this problem is the $98 billion is an estimate. So that it's not an accumulation of a lot of specific uh, improper payments that then you could go pursue. And there's a lot of reasons. Some cases they're paying people who aren't eligible for the program. In other cases, there's duplicate payments or overpayments. There are a lot of reasons and there are a lot of different reasons for the different programs. But you're right, S better systems are the key, uh, but they need to be tailored to the specific types of programs. Thank you, your time is up. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Madam, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And before you start my time, Mr. Dadar, I, I notice you may have some back problems, and if you would be more comfortable answering my question standing up, please feel free to do so. Okay. Um, I, I'm a fellow back sufferer sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I, I'm so glad my friend and colleague from Illinois brought up the issue of overpayments. Um, don't I recall a GAO report last fall that cited $61 billion in overpayments to Medicare? Uh, there, there, I believe the number last year for Medicare and Medicaid was, was close to the 40-some billion. Let me, let me just check. Okay, it was over 50, 50. Over 50? Yeah, right. And, and don't I recall that the health care reform bill we passed recently, in part, is financed by trying to get our arms around some of those overpayments, a substantial portion of those overpayments. Is that not true? I, b I believe there are efforts. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, you know, is, uh, I'm not, completely sure on that answer. I know that there is a lot of effort to try to reduce right. some of the waste in, well, in those I, programs. I just find it ironic that some on the other side of the aisle expressed enormous skepticism about our ability to finance health care by getting our arms around overpayments. It had to, it had to, in fact, reduce benefits when, in fact, overpayments are substantial. And if we can get our arms around those overpayments, and I believe the health care reform bill, by the way, uh, enhances enforcement to try to get at these overpayments. As a matter of fact, we can reduce Medicare and Medicaid expenditures without eating into benefits. In theory, would that not be true, Mr. Dodaro? Uh, th there's definitely actions that could be taken to eliminate uh, waste and fraud in the health care area. I think that's well demonstrated. Thank you. Um, let me ask a question th about, and uh, maybe to both you and Mr. Gregg. The, uh, would it be fair to say that the one of the chief, if not the chief, contributing factor to deficits, growing deficits in the out years, is in fact health care costs for the federal budget? I also want to comment that uh, definitely uh, rising health care costs and changing demographics, but the health care costs, rising health care costs are the primary driver, and I'll ask Mr. Gregg. Yeah, I think it's a uh, series of things, Congressman, everything from uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Social Security, defense, and you know on down the list. And uh, for, the, for fiscal nine, also unemployment was was uh, uh, exceptionally high, and we also had like 460 billion of, of revenues that that uh, 
have been there the previous year that didn't show up because of the economy. So it's a, a, uh, a long list of things. Certainly health care is, is one of the big drivers. You saw the CBO report that said that in the first 10 years, the health care reform bill we passed in Congress would reduce the total debt by about $138 billion, but in the second 10 years would reduce it by at least $1.2 trillion. Any reason to doubt those numbers? I'm not an expert in that, but I, I certainly, uh, CBO is well respected, so uh, I think they uh, have a lot of credibility. Just interested, um, have either of you ever seen any legislation passed by Congress before that has ever been projected to reduce the deficit by 1.2 trillion with combined 1.3 plus trillion over 20 years? I can't say that I have. I can't think of anything offhand. I can't either. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dodaro, um, if you look at uh, declining, you know, where we were as a percentage of GDP in terms of debt immediately after World War II, and you look at the next 30 or even 40 year time period, would it be fair to say that actually we brought down the debt as a percentage of GDP? Uh, primarily through a, a combination of uh, economic growth and, uh, and uh, other control measures, not so much by cutting spending. If my memory serves me right in terms of historical purposes, there was considerable economic growth, which was a contributing factor, uh, but I do think uh, there were, you know, fiscal discipline and approaches that were put in place uh, as well to help you know, control and contain and make appropriate decisions from a fiscal prudence standpoint. But I mean, if you looked at federal spending patterns, for example, in the 60s, big spurt in growth. There was a big spurt in growth, but there were also small, you know, surpluses in, right. in, in federal government but activities. I mean, federal, we weren't slashing federal spending, is my point in that 40-year time period, under either Republican or Democratic administrations. Yeah, no, no but there was, there was control in making sure that the federal government spending decisions would be close to anticipated revenue collection during a period of time. Otherwise, you wouldn't have had that pattern uh, of growth. That's all I'm saying. And it, economic growth is important and will be important going forward to address this problem, but economic growth alone, in our opinion, won't solve it by itself. I, I would agree with you, of course, but I, I'm, I'm only getting at the historic record would suggest we did not bring down uh, the debt as a percentage of GDP by massive spending cuts. That is not what the record shows. Yeah, well, there's a lot of reasons for it. I agree with that. Thank you. I believe my time is up. Um, I call on Mr. Quello from Texas. Thank you very much. I uh, have questions for the next set of panel, uh, but I do want to thank all of y'all for, for being here. I think the um, the issues that you all have uh, brought up is so important to all of us, but uh, I do want to thank all of you, but I'm going to reserve my questions for the next panel. I have a, uh, just a few more questions I'd like to address to the panel, and so We'll do a second round. If there's anything else that you would like to uh, chime in on, please let me know. Um, <coughs> since improper payments have been mentioned several times, uh, OMB recently issued guidance for the implementation of Executive Order 13520, reducing improper payments. Uh, what impact do you think these additional tools will likely have on efforts not only to reduce, but to prevent future improper payments? And GAO has recommended that OMB take actions to ensure that smaller programs with higher uh, risk are covered by the uh, Single Audit Act. So uh, any one of you that would like to. Mr. Chairman, I will uh, I'll address that, that question. Um, there, there has been a good, a good discussion so far on, on improper payments. I'd like to 
uh, before I get to your, your, your direct question, just respond to some of the, the earlier comments that were made. Um, first of all, one of the important, let's start with the premise that uh, $98 billion in improper payments is completely unacceptable and, and clear action needs to be taken. One of the things that's caused that number to go up over time has been um, basically an increase in outlays, increase in unemployment insurance outlays. So even if you have, uh, for example, in the unemployment insurance program, a constant error rate of 10%, as the numbers go up in terms of the outlays, the improper payment total goes up. And we've seen that in both uh, in the healthcare realm and unemployment insurance in other ways. Another reason why the number goes up is because we're measuring more programs and we're getting better at detecting uh, where our errors are and uncovering them. So the $98 billion is not good news, but within that construct, there are some positive elements, uh, in particular our ability to, to find and root out these errors uh, more effectively. Um, with respect to the executive order, uh, what we've done under the executive order is take a collective eight years of experience managing the improper payments problem since, it, since the uh, Improper Payments Information Act was first uh, brought to law in 2002 and tried to define what we believe to be the most effective targeted solutions that are going to move the dial. Uh, Mr. Dodaro mentioned assigning a senior accountable official in each organization for uh, improper payments, and we've already seen uh, that that ha has engaged uh, a higher level and senior leadership attention to the issue. We've also looked a lot at incentives, and the executive order tackles this question of incentives in terms of uh, one of the major players in improper payments are state governments. Many of these programs, for example, Medicaid and others, are administered through state governments. And it's important that the state government officials who are playing such a critical role in implementing these programs feel accountable and incentivized to try to measure and do more on their error. And so one of the things the executive order does, it establishes a, uh, a working group, an, inter an intergovernmental working group, to define and identify different incentives that can be put in place to drive states to do more uh, to, to drive errors down. We also have, uh, we're also looking at incentives for contractors uh, to report er improper payments that are paid to them earlier in the process, so they're part of the solution as we work to prevent these errors. And uh, Ms. Chairwoman, you mentioned the single audit process. One of the things that the executive order does is it recognizes that the single audit, which is the main driver in which uh, federal funds are evaluated, uh, the, uh, the appropriateness of, of how they're spent, uh, is, is done through the single audit at the state and local level. And if you look at the single audit today, and we've started to examine it very closely, a lot of the questions that are scrutinized uh, during the single audit process don't relate to the bottom line of whether the money was paid out correctly and for the right purpose. There are a lot of what could be arguably termed extraneous questions during the single audit process about other compliance elements which aren't as central to the bottom line question of whether the money is being paid out correctly. So what we're looking to do is looking at ways of shifting the footprint or the focus of the single audit so that we're pounding away at the question of whether these monies were spent correctly and, and then in the right amount to the right, uh, for the right purpose, rather than some of the other, what I would, I would argue are less central compliance issues. Because in any audit, and I'm sure Mr. Darrow would, would concur with this, there's a limited resources, so you have to use a risk management approach in terms of where you scrutinize. And we believe at OMB that the single audit is a place where we can really shift our, em our uh, emphasis to improper payments in a way that's going to uh, improve our results in this area. Uh, we have uh, many, many more questions that we'd like to ask, but uh, uh, being aware of the time, uh, we're going to move to the second panel. And uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for your testimony. Other questions we can send to you in writing, and we would hope to get a response that we'll share with the committee and with the full committee. Thank you so very much.
Good to be right. Mr. Corey, are, you are, uh, okay, we're going to be addressing your bill, so you might want to come and sit a little closer. I don't know if these other members are coming back, but why don't you move in closer? And uh, with the second panel in place, it's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before you testify. And I'd like to ask uh, all of you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let uh, the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And I will now take a moment to introduce our distinguished uh, witnesses. Uh, Mr. John Burton is the manager of the public information and uh, report production for the Texas Legislative Board, where he has worked since 1984. And he oversees the preparation of budget evaluation and performance-related publications and analysis for the Texas legislature. And you have a counterpart in California by the name of John Burton. <laughs> you might know him. His brother was here in the house. It's written, yeah. Uh, Mr. Michael J. Hedinger is Director of Practice Planning and Marketing for the Grant Thornton LAOPs PDs, uh, global public sector and uh, practice. Mr. Hedinger oversees firm-wide strategic business planning and federal marketing activities. Previously, Mr. Hedinger served as staff director of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform Subcommittee on Government Management, Finance, and Accountability, where he developed and helped to pass the Department of Homeland Security Financial Accountability Act. He also worked as a senior lobbyist at Patton Boggs LLP and as chief of staff to former Representative Tom Davis of Virginia. And uh, Veronique Deruji, am I correct with that pronunciation? Thank you. Uh, earned her doctorate in economics at the University of Paris and uh, the Pathion uh, Sorbonne in the areas of uh, public choice and public finance. She currently serves as a senior research fellow at the uh, Mercatus Center at George Mason University, where she also previously served as a postdoctoral fellow and visiting scholar. And I welcome all of you and thank you uh, for your patience, and I ask that uh, each one of the witnesses now give a brief summary of your testimony, and uh, keep the summary, if you can, under five minutes in duration, because your complete written uh, statement will be included in the hearing record, 
And uh, Mr. Barton, uh, you may proceed. Thank you. My name is John Barton, and I am the Public Information Officer and Manager of Report Production for the Texas Legislative Budget Board. I've been on the staff of this nonpartisan, highly respected legislative